my name is Sarah Crispo. I'm the coordinator of museum engagement and outreach. Uh, for those of you, if you're not familiar with the DAR, uh, it does stand for the Daughters of the American Revolution. And we are a museum that is founded to further the goals of that organization for historic preservation and the education pieces. So we collect objects from American houses, mostly from the 17 and 1800s. And uh, we put them in various exhibits and programs that we, that we do, uh, we, including this one. So uh, we, for today, we are using the um, webinar format. And so what that means is you have the ability to use both the chat and the Q&A. And so if you have questions for our speaker, <clears throat> you can put them in the Q&A and I will ask them of her at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have questions during the presentation and some of you have utilized that already, uh, I'll be monitoring the chat and I'll do my best to answer them as they arise. And if I do not have an answer for you, I will save them and I will ask them to Heidi at the end. So uh, without further ado, I present to you Heidi Campbell Schoff. She is the chief curator of the DAR Museum, and I will turn myself off. Thanks, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, and I will preface this um, talk this today with a couple of things. This was a program that I researched and created for uh, another presentation that I gave at the Museum of the American Revolution um, in Philadelphia earlier this spring. So um, if you had seen that um, already, then this will be a review for you. Um, but let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, yeah. I'm gonna uh, minimize my screen so there's just more of the other screen, my picture. So there's more <laughs> of the other screen so you can see it. Uh, Sounds go. good. Uh, um, so uh, I wanna tell you a little bit about myself, but not much. Um, I spent much of my career working in community created museums. And um, when I work with a collection, Usually one thing that comes to mind almost immediately is um, to paraphrase the song by the Talking Heads, how did we get here? Um, how did the collection come to be the way that it is? Every collection has mysteries and one created by a group of people in contrast to one created by a single collector um, embodies several priorities or influences. The DAR Museum, I consider it as a community-based museum, particularly during the time period that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, it is one that grew from the intentions of the organization's founders, uh, shown here in an um, 1892 photograph, to, quote, collect and preserve historical and biographical records, documents, and relics, unquote. The community in this case is the membership of the National Society, Daughters of the American Revolution. Uh, the DAR, as it's commonly known, was founded in October 11th, 1890 in Washington, D.C., and is made up of women who can trace their family tree to a person who performed military service or in some other way supported the American Revolution. As founder Eugenia Washington, shown in this picture right here, um, wrote in the Washington Post in August 1890, one of the missions of the Daughters of the American Revolution was, quote, to preserve souvenirs of the revolution, unquote. This photo was taken by famed photographer Matthew Brady and shows the organization's leadership gathered for their annual meeting in 1892, as I said. Much has already been written about why the lineage organization was created, but relatively little has been said about its museum and collection. This presentation is based on my research in the DAR's organizational archives and published proceedings from its annual national meeting and articles in its membership magazine known at various times as the American Monthly Magazine, the, DA the Daughters of the American Revolution Magazine, and currently American Spirit. My intention was to discover how the museum's collections came to look the way they do. For this lecture, I'm focusing on the first 50 years of the museum from 1890 to 1940. It is not only a way to make 130 plus years of history more manageable, but the late 1930s brought about 
several changes which significantly impacted the museum and its collections. Reading through the early documents, the AR members had a nearly religious fervor and idealization of the revolutionary generation, or patriots, and they worried the tangible connections that objects made to this group would be lost. Founder Mary Ellett Cable said in her address in 1892 to the assembled membership, quote, the New Englander transfers himself and his belongings from Maine to Michigan or perchance to Florida. It is not possible that under these, it is not, is it not possible that under these circumstances, treasures of inestimable value to the historian may be lost, which if preserved would keep the past ever present in our hearts? Is the traveler seeking a new home under different skies liable to preserve the antique silver, the oaken desk, the portrait of his ancestor, the Minuteman, or the dispatches written to his great-grandmother by the farmer soldier who carried a musket from Lexington to Yorktown? This is one of the early indicators of what informed the DAR's collecting and the direction it would take. To spearhead the accumulation of objects, the DAR created a Revolutionary Relics Committee. This committee was led by a chairman, vice chairman, and secretary, and included the state regents, the name for the state level executive officer of the DAR, of each state. The committee's officers provided structure to the collecting efforts and an occasional prod for state regents to locate revolutionary relics for donation to the organization. In her annual report, Sue Virginia Field, chairman of the Revolution Revolutionary Relics Committee in 1897 urged DAR members to, quote, search their homes for mementos of their honored ancestors and lend them to our national society to teach more widely than can be done at home lessons of patriotism to the rising generation and a knowledge of those deeds of valor of the brave men and women who made our government whose names and deeds we live to commemorate, unquote. She also reported that the officers of the United States National Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, have assigned as much space in that building as we desire, and that articles which we have placed there will be as carefully guarded as the exhibits of our government are, until such time as our Continental Hall shall be built, and that the only case there which we have which we have as, part, as yet partly filled can now be known by the insignia of our order, which is placed upon it. And this is an image of that case at the Smithsonian. Throughout the early years of the museum, the women report consulting members of Smithsonian staff, as well as that of the manuscripts division of the Library of Congress for advice. When the DAR's first building, Memorial Continental Hall, was complete in 1911, the collection moved into a gallery on the south side of the building. Over the next 30 years, the DAR purchased more cases for their growing assemblage, seeking the advice of Smithsonian staff on their design and construction. We've now arrived at the heart of the matter. What did the DAR collect and what were their aspirations for the collection and the museum they created? Most of the subjects that found their way into the DA, most of the objects that found their way into the DAR's collection were a result of the efforts of the Revolutionary Relics Committee. In the early years, these donations included three dimensional objects as well as manuscripts, printed documents, and other two dimensional items. In 1940, the manuscripts and imprints were removed from the collection's care and became the foundation of the Americana collection managed by the DAR's historian's office. This office also maintains the organizational archives and collects objects relevant to DAR history. The vast majority of the DAR museum's collections were donations from members. However, non-members, women and men, usually at the coaxing of a member, gave us historical artifacts as well. It appears during these early years, the museum rarely had dedicated funds to purchase objects for the collection, even though they were frequently approached with items to buy. As I mentioned in my introduction, the DAR museum collection is primarily a community collection. That community is the DAR membership and their friends and acquaintances. 
by 1890, most women who had the time and resources to pursue genealogy or had their family history already recorded for them tended to be upper middle or upper class and white. Therefore, the collection reflects this demographic. I'd like to mention here one interesting donation appearing in the 1923 proceedings that I came across. Mary B. Heyer of Norfolk, Virginia donated, quote, flax cultivated by the slaves of Captain and Mrs. Olive Wood Woodward Smith of Virginia on their farm near Great Bridge. Captain John Smith's slaves worked on the fort at Port Portsmouth, Virginia, so gave Revolutionary War service, unquote. This is the first time I've seen such an attribution and recognition of enslaved labor in a source of this type from this era. There's also recognition by at least one DAR member that some African Americans could qualify for membership in the DAR as their ancestors gave patriotic Revolutionary War service. The unifying theme of the collection was the revolution, what the women of the DAR in 1890 consider revolutionary was not what we typically would assume. This poem, written by DAR member Florence I. W. Burnham of Connecticut and published in the August 1911 issue of the American Monthly Magazine, the DAR's membership magazine, illustrates well the mindset of the collectors and their priorities. I've highlighted in red the relics mentioned that are associated with the military, and the items in blue are household and other items. And uh, I won't go ahead and read it um, to you, but you can go ahead. I'll, I'll pause here a little bit so give you an, a chance to uh, read it for yourself. The poem, a fine example of colonial revival romanticism of the past, provides us another clue when you examine the objects listed in its verses. The first thing mentioned isn't a weapon of war, but a spinning wheel, and then a portrait. Not far from the spinning wheel is the sword, presumably owned by the Revolutionary War patriot. As you read through the poem, the domestic far outweighs the military. This is what the women the DAR envisioned for their museum. In 1903, the Revolutionary Rail Committee wrote, quote, we gladly accept those small personal things which bring us intimately into the lives of those who certified our independence, unquote. In 1906, the committee said, quote, there is a deeply rooted sentiment that the relics, antiques, and curios which may come to this museum must be of the revolutionary period of historic fame and of unquestioned authenticity. This page that we were looking at here was published in the uh, DAR um, membership magazine, the American Monthly Magazine. A new chairman of the committee in 1913 more thoroughly described its collecting goals. The collection of revolutionary relics should be classified into four divisions and should be limited to objects, all of which should date prior to 19, 1820. First, documentary, Deeds, wills, tax lists, rosters of troops, personal letters, etc. Second, household furnishings, antique furniture, kitchen utensils, silver, glass, pewter, articles of homespun linen, wool, etc. Third, artistic, painting, paintings, articles of virtue, etc. Fourth, weapons of warfare, guns, swords, pistols, historic flags, etc. And that's, those are her et ceteras and not mine. In addition to this heretofore unvoiced collecting policy, she convinced the DAR governing body to create an, quote, advisory board on revolutionary relics to examine all articles before being accepted by the relic committee, unquote. It isn't clear who served on this board or if it overlapped at all with the organization's art committee, which was formed to provide guidance on paintings accepted for the new headquarters building, Memorial Continental Hall, and which was made up of noted art of artists of the era. In later years, records mention C.H. Lewin-Jean, an appraiser and auction house owner, and Dr. Alfred F. Hopkins, 
a military a collector and author offered advice but it doesn't seem they were on a formal advisory board early discussions with the advisory board resulted in a recommendation that the collection be used to create quote a pictorial history of the revolutionary period unquote and a pictorial history of the most stirring events of the country and of the leading men who had a part in these events this Charlevelle musket donated to the museum in 1932 would have fit into what the advisory board had in mind one only needs to read the objects listed in a subsequent donation report in subsequent donation reports to see that the focus in on the domestic overruled the idea of having an illustration of the quote most stirring events of the country unquote the leading men part stayed however since much effort was placed into the finding and this displaying images prints mainly of all the signers of the declaration of independence such as this engraving of francis hopkinson donated in 1929 but when contemplating three-dimensional items this sofa owned by thomas mccain signer of the declaration of independence donated to the museum in 1927 is a good example of what the dar considered a revolutionary relic in 1914, the DAR created the Office of the Curator General, providing the museum executive board level representation. In 1917, Curator General Catherine Brinton Barlow, the first to serve in this capacity, reported a visitor to the museum commented, quote, your collection is dainty and beautiful as it should be in a women's museum, end quote. To which she replied, not in the least offended, Quote, you have a vision of what we hope the future to realize for us, unquote. Two years later, she wrote, the gifts donated are improving in character as the requirements of a women's museum in a women's organization would naturally call for articles of the home or the personal possessions of women. Like this bit of needlework on Dimity donated in 1924, made by the ancestor of the donor to in her words, quote, evade the taxes upon, uh, imposed upon the colonies by England, unquote. In 1936, the curator general reinforced the idea of the home as the theme of the museum and collections of the DAR Museum when she wrote that the museum was not established solely as a place for the exhibition of beautiful gifts. Rather, it is something that is weaving a story of the life and customs of our forefathers and represents a true picture of those days and the spirit which we, daughters of the American Revolution, seek ever to perpetuate." Unquote. Other curators general associated the museum with the DAR's mo motto of home and country. Curator general reports often reminded members of the collecting time frame to think prevent gifts being offered that would need to be turned down. In 1936, members were reminded that the collecting periods are revolutionary to 1800 and early Republic to 1830. You may have noticed the dates that limited the collection seem to shift over time from the colonial revolutionary era to the early Republic or to 1820 or to 1830. I haven't found any documentation as to why these dates changed but the early 19th century years may have been included to cover the post-war lives of patriots and the founding generation. This mid to late 18th century powder horn at the top, said to be carried by Thomas Taylor, ancestor of the donor, and this teacup and matching song dating from 1790 to 1810, once owned by Revolutionary War patriot Pierre Van Cortlandt, both fit easily within this collecting policy. A silver teapot made by John Curry of Philadelphia between 1831 and 1841 warranted acceptance in 1932, seemingly because the maker's shop was, quote, in the shadow of Independence Hall, unquote. And a pincushion imported in the early 19th century was deemed to fit the museum's collection in 1919 because its maker, Sally Patton of Connecticut, was the granddaughter of Revolutionary War officer Nathaniel Burt. 
Most gifts were recognized in detail and by donor in the proceedings of the DAR's annual meeting. The first 10 years are currently digitized and keyword searchable. The rest is in the process of digitization and should be complete by mid-year. These lists are an invitation to a thousand different rabbit holes of research. In addition to the proceedings, the women in charge of the museum cataloged, uh, cataloged the objects. In 1916, the curator general wrote, quote, in order to keep a true and faithful record of all the accessions in the museum, a system of catalog has been carried on, the same that is used in the National Museum, i.e. the Smithsonian, the cards of the catalog include a classification of history, of fabric, and of states, unquote. They created printed lists on at least two occasions. First, in 1903, when the DAR's collection was housed at the Smithsonian, seen here. This booklet lists a description of the object, the name of the donor, and sometimes a bit of the history that warrants its inclusion in the collection such as this miniature portrait of Sarah Rand Carter by her granddaughter, noted miniaturist, Sarah Carter Frothingham. The museum produced another published list in 1923, seen here. This time it was sold as a souvenir to members attending DAR's annual meeting to offset printing costs. Inside, the descriptions are brief and includes the catalog number and location. The coat that was believed to have been worn by Charles Carroll of Maryland when he signed the direct Declaration of Independence appears here, but not really. This coat postdates that by several decades. Due to this early and consistent focus on cataloging, we have a good understanding of the early collecting efforts. We can isolate the early accessions and see what the collection looked like at the time of the DAR's 50th anniversary in 1940. Based on what I've said today, what percentage of the collection do you think is militaria? Looking at only those items accessioned between 1890 and 1939, a little over 4,500 items, we were able to create this visual for you. What you can see here, and I'll just kind of walk you around because the colors, the little squares here are very small. So we start here with silver and flatware, and then we move clockwise around to uh, relics, archival items, paintings, portraits, and engravings, ceramic and food service, armament and accessories, costume and textiles, books, toys, and money. What you don't see here is furniture. That's because most of the furniture came into the collection. Well, first of all, there was there were some pieces of furniture uh, donated, uh, but they didn't they weren't of a, a quantity that to make this chart. Um, most of the furniture in our collection comes into the collection uh, when the um, period rooms be, uh, fall under the museum. And um, what also you might note is that, as I said, in 1940, the Americani collection is created. So the um, archival items here, as well as the books here, um, will go and be removed from the museum's collections and be transferred to the Americana collection. So we returned to the, to the museum gallery, this time in the 1920s. Cases neatly arranged in what appeared to be thematic collection. There was a case with ceramics on the far left here, a case with textiles in the center here, um, and uh, various other cases. There's glass uh, in the back you can see here, for example. There is. Um, in, the in 1936, the museum was accepted for membership in the American Association of Museums. Reading the annual reports from the Curator General after this date, you see a stronger emphasis on the educational role of the museum and not the veneration of the revolutionary generation alone. 
1938, 28 period rooms, which developed independently of the museum, came under its supervision and greatly expanded the collections, particularly in the area of furniture, as I said. The next year, in 1939, the DAR hired Helen S. Johnson, the first professionally trained museum staff member. Johnson, a college graduate and alum of John Cotton Dana's pioneering museum studies program at the Newark Museum, created the DAR Museum's first thematic exhibitions and presented an inaugural series of gallery talks. Kate Hines Steele, curator general in 1940, wrote, our museum is not only a place where articles pertaining to the history and life of the revolutionary period are collected, preserved, and displayed, but it is an active educational and cultural force in the country. It should instill lasting rather than temporary interest and should develop a desire for more knowledge. With this, we see a move away from collecting curios and relics, so popular in the 19th century and early 20th century, toward a consideration of the objects as sources of information and learning. Thank you. All right, I will open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions? You can put them in the Q and A. Um, and just for your edification, Heidi, we had people from Minnesota, Maryland, Nevada, Florida, Mississippi, Arizona, Texas, Wisconsin, Illinois, Philadelphia. Sorry, Terrific. that's not a, yeah. That's um, not a state. <laughs> that's not a state. That's what they wrote. <laughs> so I know that's not a state. <laughs> Um, can you tell me, Heidi, kind of how you how you stumbled upon the the research for this? Like what what made you pursue this? Uh, actually, I was asked by um, the director of the Museum of the American Revolution to talk a little bit about um, the DAR Museum and its collections for this um, the symposium that they had in the spring. And I'm like, sure, because. I know that a lot of people don't understand what we collect. And this was an opportunity for me to document what I already knew from working with the collection and um, reading the, the history of the objects coming into the, into the museum. I kind of already knew this information, but um, not in the sense where it was documented. So I went back and I started, really I started with, um, the uh, the proceedings, and as I said in my talk, the annual proceedings are published each year, and um, they are available on the DAR website for the first 10 years. And as I said, they're getting the rest of the uh, proceedings digitized currently, and they will be accessible on the website soon. Um, I talked with the archivists and there, there was a delay at the, at the, on the end of the digitization company. So um, we're hoping to have that available before the end of the year. Um, and what's useful is that it's keyword searchable. So I could search museum or relic or um, uh, any particular object in, you know, or um, a curator general's name. And that helped me get through a lot of the a lot of the early years, and then I had to go and work with the actual published um, documents, which are available in, at the Historian General's office. And so that helps a lot. Um, it also helps with the the articles published in the magazine. And then when I had questions about the different committees that were formed. Um, I asked the archivists and they found what they could they could uh, about these different committees, which wasn't a lot, um, unfortunately, but um, some of it's still a mystery about, as I said, about who, who was on this advisory panel, for example, and, and what did they say? <laughs> um, what was their credentials, that kind of thing. So that's sort of how I got um, through all of this um, early years. And I and the, as I said, after 1940, things change because the museum then is um, caretakers of the period rooms 
as well. And that expands the museum's footprint as well as um, uh, interpretation potential uh, when we acquired all of those um, period rooms. Okay, a couple questions from okay. uh, the attendees. One is, you mentioned a jacket that wasn't from the correct period, the jacket of a yes. declaration signer. So yes. why did why did the DAR museum decide to keep that? Uh, well, it is from the Carroll family, and um, it ha is one of the as it shows, it's one of the earliest uh, one of the earliest uh, donations. So it has a. Uh, a do it's documented to the Carroll family. And um, since we are also looking at the early um, federal period, and that is what is, that jacket is from, that still fits within the, the collecting policy, both of uh, the current museum and um, the museum at the time. Okay, so it was just misattributed to a signer yes. of the Declaration of Independence, but it was still yes. a historic item. Yes, yes. Okay. And and that happens a lot in the collection. And I've seen that happen in many, many um, collections, misattribution based on, um, well, the donor said it was owned by this, you know, revolutionary relative, but it, it was something that was either made or acquired um, after this person died. So therefore, well, no, it's not really theirs, is it? So there's that, but there's also what I think is was going on uh, as well is that, you know, these Revolutionary War patriots lived long after, sometimes, long after the revolution was over and they were capturing those objects as well, things in, in their home. So something from the 1830s could well have been owned by a Revolutionary War soldier. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, I think that is why they they had that kind of um, wide time frame to collect from. Excellent. And uh, so another question is, does the museum ever deaccession items which are subsequently considered unworthy? We do deaccession items. Um, it's a, a responsible uh, way of that museums take in looking at the objects and how well we can care for those objects, how well they actually do fit into the, the collection, uh, the collecting policies. Um, and uh, we do that fairly regularly. Um, those objects are then approved by the uh, DAR's board, and then they are um, published in the DAR's uh, on the DAR's website, and then um, sent out for auction. That is the most common way museums um, uh, remove items from their collection, um, so that there is no um, uh, there's an equal chance for anybody to acquire those items again. Um, once they're out back out into the world. Um, occasionally we will transfer items if there are there is the if there is a museum that is interested in an object that um, and it's a better home for it in another museum, we will transfer items to another museum as well. Uh, Madeline says thank you for this interesting talk. I am wondering whether the development of the DAR museum is similar to that of the Museum of the Confederacy uh, now known as the Civil War Museum in that both started out as with um, veneration in quotes and then have changed considerably both in format and purpose over time. Uh, that's a good observation. I, I would say yes, in some ways, I would think that, um, I don't know all the ins and outs of the creation of the Museum of the Confederacy, but I would say, yeah, in a general sense, I think that is probably accurate um, and that it has expanded and as uh, museum practice has changed as well as uh, with the involvement of professional staff. And um, again, as, as, we, as our understanding of history is changing constantly, which is a good thing, um, then the museums change as well. And next question, is there any per one particular item that may be typically overlooked by visitors that you wish everyone really took the time to see and appreciate? Oh, wow. 
<laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> that's a hard question to answer. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, we have so many interesting objects that have interesting stories. Um, I, I think that uh, we have a, a small but very interesting powder horn collection that po people probably don't know about. Um, certainly not on, you know, not expansive, but we, we do have that and we exhibit those in our study gallery, um, but not all together. So um, that I think would be something that people probably wouldn't expect to find uh, at our museum. Uh, Susan wants to know, you mentioned 4,500 items in the collection. What is the current item count? Um, the current item count is around 24,000. Wow. And that includes, you know, everything so small as literally a pin, a straight pin to, you know, all of our furniture. Um, so, you know, there are a lot, there are a lot of very small things um, that are included in that as, as well. But, you know, when you think about our, you know, various period rooms, which number around 29, depending on how you, um, how you uh, define the period room, um, and then the various galleries we have, um, it's, and then we have about 20, if I remember correctly, 24% of the collection is on exhibit at any one time, um, which is very high for a museum. Most museums exhibit um, about up to 5% of their collections at any one particular time. So, um, so you see, you're seeing quite a bit of the collection when you, whenever you come to visit the, the museum. And as a DA, uh, Madeline wants to know, again, as a DAR who lives in the DC area, are there opportunities to help with digitizing, file tagging, or other volunteer work associated with the collection? Um, great question. Uh, we have actually our, our records, our, our accession records have been digitized already. Um, what we're currently working on now is uh, photograph, making sure the records are, have a good photographs and that the and it's it's sort of where it goes it gets slowed down is um, making sure um, all of the records that we do put on the web in our our web searchable database um, have the accurate information and up to date information in it in them so that is something that the curators have to review. Um, we also have um, the help of some interns um, from museum studies programs around the area um, assist uh, sometimes, but we we have we only have you know um, an intern or so a semester, so that's where it slows down. Um, but if you're interested in working with um, records collections, um, we'd be interested in talking more with you so that we can get more of our records um, onto our web database. And uh, the easiest way to do that would probably be to just email museum at dar.org uh, just to get, a, get you into the system and then we can uh, point you in the right place. Uh, Kristen wants to know what are some of your favorite period rooms that are available in the museum? Oh, wow. Um, you know, I like them all for different reasons. Um, I'll tell you this: the most the, from our from our um, our visitor surveys that we do every once in a while, the most popular period room with visitors is the Texas Room, um, which is an actual reproduction of an actual house in uh, Texas, um, and it's of a very um, sort of I would say middle class, working class type of house with the shipboard, um, uh, shiplap as, as we are, as we call it today, but um, it was way, yeah, it was way before it was, uh, was made popular. Um, but, um, and the stenciled walls that has been, that was one that's very popular with uh, visitors. And I, I enjoy seeing that and, and the actual um, story of the people who, 
um, inhabited that, um, the real version of that space. Um, of course, you can't deny the New York uh, period room in its early um, 19th century um, grandeur of, of what a room uh, in a mansion of the period might have looked like with its stenciled and hand painted and gilt wallpaper. Um, and if you haven't been there recently, you'll you'll see new um, draperies as well in that room. Um, one thing I'd like to say about the period rooms and uh, is that some of the rooms by necessity are depict a upper class, most of the rooms depict an upper class um, home. Um, especially rooms such as the New York uh, room um, and Ohio is another one. Uh, because the, these rooms started out as offices in Memorial Continental Hall and the scale of those rooms were is much larger than what a typical home would have, um, even at the time the building was built um, in the early 20th century we have to sort of suspend that requirement in, recre in creating some of these period rooms. Um, otherwise, we would be constructing rooms within rooms to lower um, ceilings and to make rooms much smaller and then make windows much smaller um, to do to pick uh, an actual room from the particular period we're, in, we're interpreting. So um, some of those rooms are uh, expanded much more um, than what you would find um, in size um, and in scale than what you would find in in typical homes at the at the period that that is being interpreted. And Susan would like to know if there are backstage tours offered anytime. Um, sometimes, yes, we do uh, backstage tours. Um, we do uh, tours of. Uh, occasionally we'll do tours of storage that's a little more difficult because um, we like to keep our storage as um, as clean as possible and not to say that visitors aren't clean but I'll tell you things come in on our clothes that you have no idea um, and that then that could do damage to our our collection so um, we're very careful and we limit uh, behind the scenes tours of the uh, collection storage, but um, we've done tours of our offices. We have uh, we've done tours, special tours of our period rooms with the, the curator of the period rooms so that you get an idea of, you know, what his thinking is when he creates a particular uh, scenario or, um, you know, chooses a particular wallpaper style or, or floor covering style um, and that type of thing. Sasha wants, or well, Sasha's family society has an amazing quilt made from the jackets of British redcoats killed around Rye, New Hampshire during the revolution. Oh. Um, does DAR oh. have anything like that in our collection? Um, we have a quilt that was, um, it, it's also a woolen quilt um, and it is associated with a, um, a revolutionary um, era tailor and um, there's some talk about some of the, the textiles in that quilt may be related to um, or of a revolutionary era um, coats or um, or other garments, but that we don't have it um, documented as as you suggest. Um, but that's that's the closest one that we have. And I think the last question is, Joanne wants to know what you consider your most valuable piece of furniture. Yeah. Um, well, in the museum world, we don't talk of value in dollars and cents. We talk of it as an interpretive value um, in that sense. Um, that is a good question. I think that um, one of our more recent, um, recently acquired objects um, is um, a, a mirrored um, dresser made by Thomas Day, the African-American um, 
cabinet maker well known in North Carolina. Uh, we just acquired that, um, which is very exciting because uh, we want to expand even more our ability to talk about all of the types of Americans that lived um, in the past. And um, this helps us do that. Um, so I think that is interpretively very valuable. Um, the Thomas McKean sofa that I showed is is also interpretively very valuable um, because of the story that goes along with it and um, that he, you know, it, it it is seen on his inventory, his 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 home's inventory, his probate inventory. Um, not being the furniture curator, I can't say in particular anything else, but I, I, I have a feeling that the furniture curator would tell me, well, you should really have mentioned this piece of furniture. Uh, <laughs> but those are the two that come off the top of my head. And uh, I put the information in the chat, but the museum is open uh, for free to the public Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. and Saturday from 9 to 5. Uh, closed on Sundays and holidays, but you can you can um, visit our website, dar.org slash museum, uh, and get all the information about coming to see all this stuff for yourself when you're in town or if you're already in town. All right, I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Heidi, for taking the time sure. uh, to talk more about the museum with us. Um, mm -hmm. And thank you everyone for attending.